So let's get rolling right into our second set of notes, technically third, I guess, um, but this one on kind of a new topic where it's not just an introduction to development, but instead we're talking about the first stages of life, which is prenatal development and newborn development. So that starts really at conception, right? And yes, you do need to know kind of the biological, anatomical things that kind of go into creating a human being. And at conception, that is one male sperm fertilizes one female egg. And at this point, the egg, once it's fertilized, creates this like wall, right? This stone wall essentially that blocks all other sperm from getting in because it has what it needs in order to kind of go through the cell reproduction process and become a human being. Women, just a couple of things to note about what's going on um, at conception. When we're actually born with all the eggs they will ever have, and through kind of the process, only one in 5,000 actually then mature. Really interesting, right? But men, however, begin producing sperm at around puberty, and they produce it around the clock for the rest of their life. Now, the quality of that sperm um, does not maintain what it was in a man's peak, right? Around 19 through like, I don't know, 30 years old. Um, but they're still producing that, right? They're not born with the number of sperm they'll ever have. Okay, so let's talk about some genetics here and what we need to understand at conception. So this new one cell entity that is a fertilized egg um, contains 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, so 23 halves were given by the female, 23 halves were given by the male at conception. So again, one member of the pair from the mother and the other member of the pair from the father, right? And so it kind of forms these X looking things and that one side is from mom, the other side is from dad. Each chromosome contains thousands of genes, either individually or in combination, genes produce the particular characteristics of each person. So these little chromo chromosomes that you have down here are create, have thousands of genes in them, and within those genes are the DNA, right? And that is what makes us individuals and different from every other human being on the earth, and that is crazy. So let's talk about those three components again, making sure we understand what contributes to what, because it's a pretty common question on AP, the AP exam to make sure you know how that works. So you have DNA is the smallest, and then G DNA is actually in genes, and genes are in the chromosomes. And each of those contribute in a way to make us the individual, unique, like no one else person that we are. So genes, again, are composed of sequences of DNA molecules. Some genes are responsible for the development of systems common to all humans, right? So some genes give us our heartbeat and all that that takes, the circulatory system, brain, lungs, etc. But others control characteristics that make each human unique. So some control our eye color, height, facial features, mannerisms, personality traits, etc. Sex is also determined by a combination of genes, but it's in the 23rd chromosome. So that's good to know. It's a co also a common question that on the 23rd chromosome, that's which one um, determines the sex. Please remember that female is XX. So the female in the um, at conception can only give an X. So the male at conception is XY. So he can give either X or Y and therefore determines the sex of, of the fertilized egg. Okay, so now that it's a fertilized egg, right? Well, what is it? Let's talk about that. A fertilized egg, the technical term is zygote, um, and fewer than half of these actually survive the first two weeks. So fewer than half of pregnancies, you could say, are even known about. Isn't that crazy? Um, it's just, it, it just kind of boggles my mind that, wow, fewer than half of fertilized eggs actually become into what we know and understand as pregnancy and that they're just kind of flushed out in a woman's menstrual cycle. And she didn't even know that she was, quote, pregnant. 
Okay, after the zygote stage, um, which is the first two weeks, okay, it goes into the embryonic stage, which is weeks two through eight. So the embryonic stage is when the woman is finding out that she is pregnant. So at two weeks, the zygote becomes an embryo. By four weeks, the embryo has developed a rudimentary beating heart and that there is a heartbeat there. Um, it would be difficult to pick up from an ultrasound. It would have to be an internal ultrasound, not an external one. Um, also a brain and intestinal tract. These organs are very primitive. So it kind of makes sense that they're developing first. They're the most basic that we have, you could say, especially about the brain, right? Like we're not developing all the complex neural networks up in our cerebral cortex yet. We don't finish doing that until age 25, not even thinking about embryonic development, right? Um, but they can be recognized. By eight weeks, the embryo is about an inch long. That's like that long has arms legs and a face that are distinct still very tadpole like but it's there right you can you can tell what it's going to become so just to give you kind of some images to go along with your understanding and that here's the essentially zygote at six days it's a fertilized egg going through the process of cell reproduction here it is at four weeks very tadpole like right so this feature this kind of um thing here is the umbilical cord which fuels the baby nurtures and gives it nourishment um, this is what becomes the heart and then into the belly these little nubs here and here what start the arms and the legs um, this kind of tail here kind of forms up into what is your tailbone you can see the spine back there and then this big thing up here will become the head and there's like little nubs that start to become the eyes and the eyes actually start out on the side of the head and then move inward kind of crazy um, which is also seen over here at eight weeks when it becomes um, the next stage kind of at the end of the embryonic stage and again there's the umbilical cord still forming right like this is the the belly and where the organs are going to kind of be um, and you can see the formation of the eye and that head is still huge and it, it really is for a very long time okay so at the um from eight weeks then all the way to birth is the fetal stage so it week eight or nine ish um it's now called a fetus this is kind of funny because it really is called a fetus up until it is birthed at which point it is a baby but you know like i guess when you know it's warm and fuzzy like a woman and the father is going to call it a baby right um but it actually technically is a fetus so if you hear a doctor talking about that the fetus that's what it is by around four months gestation which is four months into the pregnancy fetal movement is strong enough to be detected by the mother so she can feel that right um, and then at around six months, the eyelids open, um, the fetus has well-developed grasp and even taste buds on the tongue. So interesting. Okay, the fetus reaches what's called the age of viability um, at about 24 weeks. This is the point at which it can survive if it's born prematurely. Now, that rate of survival is about 50%. So about 50% of preemie babies, premature babies, survive at this age, and that percentage increases each week that it passes. So a doctor and their team is going to do everything they absolutely can if a woman were to go into premature labor um, to keep that baby in there as long as possible, as long as it's still safe for the baby, right? Um, and there's so many things that modern medicine can do to make the pregnancy as successful as possible while keeping the baby and mom, because both are, an, are, are a priority, keeping them safe. The fetus continues to grow and gain weight during the last two months of the pregnancy and at the end of a normal 38 week, technically 40 week, about nine and a half to 10 months of pregnancy, the fetus typically weighs around seven pounds and is about 20 inches in length. It's technically considered that it's 37 weeks the baby is full term, um, but doctors really want the baby to stay in there as long as possible, right? Keep cooking as long as possible, as long as they continue to grow at a healthy rate and don't get too big for mom's stature to want to keep her safe too for the delivery process. 
Okay, so in some prenatal influences, we want to talk about genetics and that um, at conception, what is um, determined genetically, which we know almost like everything about you physically is. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about here. So this is a lot that's on the screen, so just take it little by little. Genetic factors that influence prenatal development. These are a major cause um well, let me take that back. A major cause of genetic defects is faulty genes or chromosomes, right? So if you see something going wrong with a fetus, with a baby, may, those are normally caused by genetic defects. There's something called PKU. Um, this is, long story short, the inability to break down protein. And every single baby since 1978 because that's when they first started testing for this, is tested immediately within the first, like while they're still at the hospital, first few days of life. I think all three of my boys were tested within the first 24 hours of being born, pretty sure. Um, they just get a little heel prick, take some blood, and test for PKU. If someone, if a baby has PKU, it's an inability to break down protein, and that changes a lot about their diet. Now that we've had testing and, you know, again, modern technology and science, they're able to um, really monitor their diet and make sure that they're eating foods, although more expensive, um, do not contain protein. Um, and, and that's simply what it is, inability to break down protein. So what would happen if a child who has PKU eats protein? It causes a both physical and mental slowdown. Um, I guess you could say depression of the brain and the body and that brain activity is lowered hu immensely to a point where they will be wheelchair bound and um, cognitively not really there. Tay-Sachs disease is another one where the body is unable to break down fat. So kind of like PKU, but with fat, which causes these substances to build up in and destroy brain and nerve cells until the nervous system shuts down. So babies usually start exhibiting signs of the disease around four to six months old, um, and they actually usually die by the age of five. So, so, so sad. If parents both carry the genetic defect, the child has a one in four chance of being born with the disease. To me, that sounds like, oh, it's most certainly that they're going to have it, but genetics are kind of a funny thing and that there's still a chance they won't. It seems to occur most frequently in Central and Eastern European Jewish and their descendants. Okay, so let's spend some time talking about that last one, which is Down syndrome. So this occurs when a zygote, right, fertilized egg, right at conception, receives actually an extra chromosome at the moment of conception. So either the male or female has given 24 halves of a chromosome instead of just 23. This causes intellectual disability, usually in the mild to moderate range, it can be more severe, but it is kind of like a spectrum um, and it can the person can fall on that line anywhere. It's often related to a mother's age as well. Um, as the woman ages, if we're talking 35 and over, um, the the rate of her baby having Down syndrome increases. Characteristics um, include, well, it includes characteristic facial features and that a lot of, well, with people with Down syndrome, you can kind of see it in their face. So it includes an upward slanted, upward slanted eyes, a smaller nose, ears, and mouth, and sometimes smaller hands and shorter necks. So these are just some characteristics, often accompanied by other health problems as well, including heart, vision, and hearing. So let's kind of shift from talking about genes and let's talk about environmental influences on prenatal development. The big one is teratogens. Teratogens are environmental agents like drugs, chemicals, or viruses, or other factors, coming from the environment that can produce birth defects. Mother's illness is a big one, like rubella, which is the German measles, it can cause blindness, deafness, heart abnormalities, and even stillbirth. Syphilis can cause mental retardation or intellectual disability, physical deformities, and miscarriage. Um, AIDS, HIV AIDS, can be passed on to the child prior to birth as well. 
some more or some other things to consider is the mother's use of drugs. So illegal drugs like cocaine can result in baby being born addicted to the drug. Um, if you have been watching the news at all, especially if you live where we do in the Midwest, you know that there is an epidemic, um, uh, opioid or heroin epidemic, and we have seen the number of babies born addicted to heroin skyrocket, and it's just, it's awful. So when the baby's born addicted, well, they're not going to be supplied that drug that they've become dependent upon anymore. So think of an adult going through withdrawal and put that in a newborn baby's body. They oftentimes can't handle it and even can't survive. It's absolutely terrible for them. Even some legal drugs can cause fetal abnormalities. And so doctors use a lot of caution on prescribing the mother any kind of Um, prescription drugs, Um, even cautioning against using antibiotics, which are like safe, right? But cautioning against using those too often. Alcohol and nicotine use, which is actually pretty common. Um, There's something called the fetal alcohol syndrome. So fetal alcohol syndrome is the condition resulting in intellectual disability and growth disabilities, right? There's huge deformities um, and delays in both intellectual and physical growth. Some physical features associated with FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, includes abnormally small, and that the person is abnormally small. Small eyes and upturned nose, smaller abnormally formed brain even. Most have some degree of intellectual disability, and many exhibit problems with attention span. So we have learning problems, coordination difficulties, and difficulties in their behavior. Smoking can lead to fewer nutrients received by the fetus, right? There's tons of research shows that smoking stunts growth. Well, think about that in a developing fetus. So it results in the fetus having lower birth weight um, and having smoking, heavy smoking may even affect the brain of the fetus. So we'll quickly wrap it up by talking about newborn development, right? So now the baby is arrived. So all babies are born with a number of reflexes. We talked about reflexes back in unit eight. Um, Well, we talked about instincts, right? And that humans don't really have instincts, but we are born with some reflexes. These are unlearned involuntary responses that through evolution and genetic mutation have allowed us to better survive that occur automatically in the presence of certain stimuli. And yes, you do need to know the difference in all of these. The rooting reflex is where a baby newborn will be touched on the cheek and they automatically turn their head. Because if you think about it, they don't have the ability to grab anything and bring it to their face to eat. They have no control over their extremities at this time. So if anything's touching their face, if there's any chance of it being food, they're going to turn to receive it. Similarly, they have to be able to suck because that's the only way that they are going to be able to eat. So they're going to suck anything that touches their lips, a finger, a pacifier, a bottle. The startle reflex. This one actually is pretty funny, but I can explain it. Okay, so this is where the infant will fling their arms, fan out their fingers, and arch their back in response to a sudden noise. Let's talk about that kind of evolutionarily speaking. So let's say there's a bang, a loud noise. Well, that signals some kind of danger normally, right? So what the baby does is make themselves as big as possible for mom to see, and then they'll actually recoil into a very similar like fetal position to make themselves small and unnoticeable to any kind of danger. How cool is that? The Babinski reflex is when toes, and I think this happens on the the hand too, toes fan out when the edge of the sole of the foot is stroked. And some, I've I've seen it with the middle of their foot as well. And that it just kind of like they fan it out because it's being stroked. Maybe it's like in an attempt to get away from it. These reflexes are lost after the first few months, definitely gone by six months of age, and they're replaced by more complex behaviors because the newborn baby at around six months is able to make associations. So when they turn their head around six months to something, it's because they know it's a pacifier or a bottle or a spoon with food on it. 
All right, so that wraps up our set of notes about prenatal newborn development. Please be sure that you check out my TPT store to find the notes that accompany this video and the rest that I have going on. Um, and please follow my channel. Everybody have a great day.